my name is Katie and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a recent read wrap up where I'm talking about the books that I read in both March and February. I didn't read enough in March to feel like I wanted to do a March wrap up so I saved it all for April but I feel like now there's a lot of books to talk about so I think even if I don't read a super lot I'm still going to do a wrap up on a monthly basis because it tends to pile up after two months anyways even if you're not reading a lot per month. So starting off with what I read in March. So the first book that I have to talk about for March is Bone Crier's Moon by Catherine Purdy and this was an arc that was sent to me by Catherine Tegren Publishers so thank you so much to the publishers for sending this arc my way. I absolutely adored this story so so much. This is a new high stakes fantasy duology and I just thought it was written so well and I loved these characters. I definitely need to pick up a finished copy at some point because I need to have this book in my collection because it's definitely something I could see myself rereading which is kind of like my rule of thumb now for getting arcs is if I feel like it's something that I will pick up again I will seek out a finished copy but that's you know just my own personal preference. Bone Criers have a sacred duty to ferry the dead into the afterlife and or they will drain the life forces from the living. However a Bone Criers power requires sacrifice and so Elise has been prepared since birth to take over as the matriarch of the Bone Criers and she must perform her ritual which is to lure her soulmate and then kill him in cold blood in order to fully obtain her bone crier powers. Bastion's father was slain by a bone crier and so he spent his whole life training for revenge on them. However, now his vengeance must wait because Elise's ritual has begun and their fates are intertwined in life and death. And to top it all off, we have Sabine, Elise's best friend who will do anything for Elise and when she gets tangled up with this situation with her ritual, Sabine will go to great lengths in order to protect her best best friend. I absolutely freaking loved this. Five out of five stars without a doubt. If you are looking for a true enemies to lovers book, this is the one for you because they are literally trying to kill each other for most of the book. I remember I was at like 40% of the book or something like that and they were still enemies so I was like pretty happy with that because that's pretty slow burn in my mind. I just thought that the way the magic system was set up was really really cool. I loved all of the um, rules when it came to the ritual. I thought it was really interesting to see how it was all laid out and what the bone criers had to do in order to be able to fully access their power and bury the dead as well as the lore of the afterlife and how the spirits functioned. I also thought the bone criers powers in general were really awesome because what you have to do as a bone crier is you go and you hunt these animals and when you hunt an animal and perform a ritual on its bone you get to like harness the power of the animal so say you would hunt a vulture and you would be able to get like eyesight in the dark. This is actually also based on the myth of Le Dame Blanche which is what Serpent and Dove is based on as well but it's so interesting to see how two YA books based on the same myth play out completely different because even though they're loosely based on the myths it's just like they're completely different. Where like the white woman plays into this is that their ritual for the bone criers takes place on a bridge and they're dancing under a full moon in a white dress. Thought that was really cool. I really enjoyed both Elise's and Sabine's characters Elise is kind of the leader in the situation where she always takes charge and Sabine is more gentle like she doesn't really want to hunt animals and kill them and then when Elise is swept up in this plot Sabine kind of has to find the strength on her own to to like help Elise and she really kind of like comes into her own strength and her own power which I thought was really cool while as like Elise and Bastion are kind of on their own character journeys where Bastion kind of has to confront his thirst for revenge and Elise has to kind of think about the bone crier's purpose and if what she's doing is right and underneath it all is a more sinister plot that threatens the balance of life and death and I just thought that it was very cleverly done, very well written and I also really enjoyed how this is a duology but it wrapped up the first storyline in this book while leaving room for the next um, to develop but like sometimes in duologies you'll find that it's just one big storyline continued but I thought it was really kind of like well packaged that like this is a book and it has the storyline and we have enough threads left open 
for the next book but it still had a satisfying end. The next book that I read in March is Red Scrolls of Magic by Cassandra Clare and Wesley Chu. I was trying to catch up on my Shadowhunters before the release of Chain of Gold. So Red Scrolls of Magic takes place in between City of Glass and City of Fallen Angels and we follow Alec and Magnus as they go on their adventure across Europe. It is their first vacation as a couple. However, chaos tends to follow them wherever they go and Magnus, it turns out, is being accused of starting a cult known as the Crimson Hand that is trying to summon a demon. And apparently he started it many, many years ago as a joke and he has no memory of it. And so they set out across Europe to try and stop this evil cult. And I absolutely adored this story. I did give it five stars. I mean, I am just Shadowhunter's trash at this point, but I really, really appreciate that we got a book that focuses on a gay and bisexual main character as well as Magnus is Indonesian or half Indonesian, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I guess he would be half Indonesian, half demon. So, um, yeah. And I just think that it's awesome that this book was published, especially because Cassandra Clare has addressed that she did have to take a pay cut in order to get this book published because publishers think that it wouldn't have been as popular. So yeah, it's really awesome. It just focuses on Alec and Magnus's relationship and I love seeing it develop in the early days. I did have some problems with how Alec's character was written in The Mortal Instruments. He could be very stoic and he obviously is dealing with a lot with like his repressed sexuality and whatnot in that series but i still felt like the way his character was written he came off kind of cold and mean and we didn't get the subtleties of his characters because he sometimes does crack these funny moments and we know that he really cares about his family but i felt like we didn't get those parts of him those more subtleties until cassandra claire developed more as a writer just specifically like for his character and so now that she is a more mature writer and she's going back and writing a younger alec i do feel like that those aspects of his personality play out more and i was really glad that we kind of got to go back in time a little bit and have him better written for how he was acting but then it just makes the events that happen between him and magnus in the latter half of the mortal instruments just like that much more sad <sighs> I also felt like this book was jam-packed with so many funny one-liners like Magnus just says the funniest things and I have so many orange tabs for funny because I was laughing like this book really made me happy because I was laughing so much every chance that I could I just adore these characters and I thought that the plot and the adventure that they go on was of course always action-packed jam-packed and does play into the larger shadow hunters storyline as a whole because as we know the red scrolls of magic do play a big role in the dark artifices so it's kind of cool to see like how it ties in as well as we get cameos from other characters that we adore such as Lily, Helen, and Aline all play big roles in this book and I just love to see them because I love their characters. I also love how we kind of got to see how Helen and Aline's relationship began. That was just awesome. So yeah, I really enjoyed this book. It's a very strong part of the Shadowhunters world and definitely a must for anyone that is a Shadowhunters fan. Continuing on with that theme, I next read Ghosts of the Shadow Market by Cassandra Clare, Sarah Reese Brennan, Maureen Johnson, Kelly Link, and Robin Wasserman. This is a short story collection following brother Zachariah. <laughs> um, throughout the years, he, brother Zachariah is a silent brother and so he is pretty much immortal and it follows his journey throughout the years. So we get tastes of characters from The Lost Hours as well as The Mortal Instruments and The Dark Artifices as well as like playing into some details that I think will be important in The Wickedest Powers which will be the next series to follow some of the younger children from the Blackthorn family in The Dark Artifices. If you don't read Shadowhunters at all. This seems very confusing. I'm gonna keep my review on this one brief because it is a short story collection. I did tab it a lot though. Um, yeah, I just always enjoy really seeing these stories. They're really fun. It's just kind of nice to get some background on the stories that maybe don't get as much page time in the novels because they are side characters and but also you get really important details that play into their storyline as a whole in the books so it is kind of important to read these short story collections. I also just love the moments that we got between this particular couple that I won't spoil because it's pretty much a big spoiler but I 
love to see the progression of it and it just makes my heart happy and I'm really happy that we got more of these characters and it is probably my favorite of the short story collections that we have so far. And then moving on, I finally got to Chain of Gold by Cassandra Clare, which is the first book in the Lost Hours. This was one of my most anticipated releases of the year and it did not disappoint. I also have this beautiful Waterstones edition as well. I just kind of want to show it off because it is so pretty. Waterstones really just does the Shadowhunters series justice and I'm so happy that I was able to snag this when I did because I love it. I just think it's so pretty and it does have like a signed stamp thing and here is the portrait of all of them. Chain of Gold follows the children of the characters from the Infernal Devices so you do pretty much need to read the Infernal Devices and like every other <laughs> Shadowhunters book up to this point pretty much to read this one so it kind of is a long way along the series of this why it's really interesting because Shadowhunters is pretty much the only YA series that I know that has like 16 to 20 books in the series and people are still reading them a lot of times YA worlds are not as involved don't have as many books so it's really fun to have something that is just like so rich in content Cordelia Carstairs and her brother are newly arrived in the in London and so they try and ingrain themselves into the London Shadowhunter Society and as well as reuniting with their childhood friends, the Herondales. They are hoping to secure a good marriage for Cordelia so that she may stop her father from ruin after he is accused of a crime that Cordelia is sure he did not commit. London has been particularly calm for many years and no one knows why until Lehman attacks are start happening left and right just when the shadow hunters get complacent and worse than that these demon attacks are unlike normal and they occur during the daytime and seem to be targeting only the shadow hunters our young heroines must set out on a journey to figure out what exactly is causing this and put a stop to it once and for all before it wreaks havoc on the shadow hunters i of course gave this book five stars i just always love how cassandra claire has the series that is ongoing and i'm not tired of it yet because it's always fresh and new and inventive i feel like even though there are so many shadow hunters books she always thinks of something new that still works within the confines of the world that she has set out like she never has to like change her own rules to make something work she just is able to work within it and is able to weave so many elements of what is happening in each story into the other books like i'm sure once we find out what exactly happens in this trilogy you can probably go back and read like the dark artifices and see references that you wouldn't have known were references when you first read them and i just think that is so smart and clever she is really i mean dazzling things this expansive you really do have to lay the groundwork I, yeah i just always think that there's something fresh and new and of course i think the thing that makes the series is that the characters are just so well characterized so fleshed out each one has their own unique thing going on and this, their own unique motivations and the way that they play against one another the dynamics i loved our little band merry thieves like they were just so great um i really admired cordelia as a character because she is just so like headstrong and willing to get what she wants and trying to do right by her family and then we have james who's kind of like very mopey and grace carstairs who is just like very mysterious and like we don't really know what's going on with her and of course we have lucy who's very bright and bubbly and just like i don't know i just feel like all of these characters are just like they just come together so well and they work so well in a group with all their different personalities you would really see how they would play off of each other in a very realistic way I just feel like the hints of romantic tension and at future relationships that will develop were like perfectly placed throughout the action. Like there are so many couples that I'm rooting for here and I actually don't know like what Cassandra Clare is going to do in terms of the pairings because I do know even though there is that family tree that was put out in the collector's edition of Clockwork Princess that apparently that might be changed. So I'm really interested to see because of course there are the Shadowhunters families that like lead to our modern day characters. So yeah, it's just really interesting. And of course this book is filled with beautiful prose. I think a lot of the times, it maybe it's not talked about as much, but like there are some really, really beautiful lines of writing in this book, some quotes that I really felt in my soul that really hit me hard. So of course I love this book. I am so excited for the rest of the Lost Hours series. This might be also one of my favorite covers. I just absolutely adore the color scheme. I mean, just like the teal with the red, it's just perfect. Cassandra Clare has basically done it again. I can go on and on and on about how much I love Shadowhunters, but Chain of Gold is definitely up there for one of my favorite Shadowhunters books. And I of course will continue to absolutely devour anything that is released in this 
world. The next book that I read is Yona of the Dawn volume 3 which is story and art by Mizuho Kusanagi and this is a manga following a young princess who is the sole heir to her kingdom however her life is turned upside down when her father is murdered on her 16th birthday and so she has to escape with her bodyguard and this is a very long series and this is only the third one but I'm really really enjoying this series so far. I think it is like technically a shoujo manga which is more like the romantic manga but it has elements of shonen because it is like an adventure so i do kind of like enjoy the different romantic tensions but also seeing yona come out of her shell and as she tries to you know like survive in this world where she is forced to flee from everything that she knows and coming into feeling more powerful and badass i really really enjoy this series and i gave this installment five stars and this is definitely a manga series that i'm so happy that i picked up and i will be continuing to read over the next few months I read The Vanishing Deep by Astrid Schulte, which is about two sisters, one dangerous secret, and 24 hours to recover the truth. 17-year-old Tempe was born into a world of water after her parents die in a boat crash. Her and her sister must depend on one another and they go diving to survive. However, tragedy strikes and Tempe's sister also drowns. Tempe spends her time scavenging the water to try and earn up enough notes to go and revive her sister for 24 hours at the island of Palindroma. But Tempe doesn't want a tearful reunion. Instead, she wants answers because after Alicia's death, she found out that her sister may have actually played a part in her parents' death. Alicia, freshly revived from the dead, one does not want to spend her last 24 hours alive locked up in a research facility being accused of a crime that she knows she did not commit. And so she convinces Tempe to help her escape. However, Palindroma does not want the secrets of the revivals to escape the island and they are hunted down across the seas. I ended up giving this book four stars. I really think that Ashtray Schulte has this very cool motif in her novels where they are set in fantasy world but they are mystery thrillers and they are usually like standalone mystery thrillers. So it's really cool seeing a these two genres meshed together and it's really innovative. I really enjoyed it. I love the setting of this underwater world where it's basically post-apocalyptic and the ice caps all melted and so like humans basically either have little patches of land or they've like collected metal to build these metal structures that they live on and so obviously the way of life is like very much more controlled because if not then like everyone will die so it's really also interesting to see that they have come up with this technology to resurrect the dead and kind of like the business that was built off of this it's very thrilling to try and unravel the mystery of what happened to their parents and how the revival program works and why they don't want people escaping why it's only for 24 hours and why they can't just bring people back to life and put them you know give them their lives back so i really enjoyed that but i think the aspect of this novel that mostly touched me was the sisterly relationship because you know like alicia was the caretaker for tempe and then she passed away and tempe kind of like is very hardened and she's very resentful and angry that she's left on her own and then when alicia is revived they are the same age so the dynamic between them has shifted and alicia kind of has to deal with waking up from the dead and, and dealing with all of this within 24 hours so it's just really heartbreaking to kind of see the emotions play out between these two sisters. That definitely was the most touching part of the novel for me. One aspect that I also really enjoyed is that the chapter headings were countdowns. So you got to always see how much time was left. I really think that that helped pace the book and make it go pretty fast. So yeah, I really enjoyed this one. If you're looking for a really interesting and unique YA thriller, definitely check this one out. So the next book that I read was House of Earth and Blood, Crescent City number one by Sarah J. Mass. Okay, this is one of my most anticipated books of the year and honestly, it was so worth it. I really loved it. I devoured this book. I read it pretty much in a whole weekend and it's 800 pages, but I could not put it down. That's just like how I get with Sarah J. Mass books. I love them so much that I cannot stop reading them. We did a whole live show on the Overhyped Book Club and that is up on my channel. I will leave it linked up below if you want to hear us talk about this book for like ever. It's just amazing. There's so much to talk about, so much to unpack with it. I will give you a brief rundown of my thoughts. So of course, to start out, Crescent City revolves around Bryce Quinlan who is half human, half fae and she is just living her life. She works at an antiques dealer during the day and then at night she is a party girl until her life is completely turned upside down when her best friend is murdered. Two years later, the same types of murders start happening again. 
even though the killer was supposedly caught two years ago when the original murder happened. Bryce, having been one of the only witnesses to the original crime, is brought in to the fray as an assistant to help find this new killer, and she must work with Hunt Athelar, who is a fallen angel. Hunt wants only to solve the case because he is being offered his freedom in exchange for catching the culprit once and for all. Bryce and Hunt dig deep into Crescent City's underbelly and find that a dark power threatens all that they hold near and dear. I just really loved this new twist on fantasy that Sarah J Mass has with this book. Well, to start off, first of all, I gave it five stars. I freaking loved it. it. I finished that book and I have one of the feelings like this might be like one of my favorite books I've ever read. I just truly think this is like one of my favorites of the year so far. Like I just freaking loved it. Like it's so rich and deep and she really does a good job of building this world that is just so detailed. And the thing that I love about Crescent City is it's like a modern day fantasy. It's like urban high fantasy because even though it is in an urban setting, all of the creatures and all the characters and stuff are for the most part supernatural so it's just really really cool i love they had like cell phones and like that they had like modern ways of communicating like they were texting each other like sending pictures snaps like all that stuff so it's just really cool to see technology infused into a fantasy world and it's not something that i've seen done a lot it almost kind of read like a modern day au of a fantasy book or like a college au of a fantasy book i don't know i just really really enjoyed the setting and i thought it was very cleverly done I of course love the characters. Sarah J Mass really does a good job of writing characters that are healing from trauma and both Bryce and Hunt have a lot of trauma that they have to deal with. Like Bryce pretty much stops functioning after her best friend dies. Like they really meant so much to each other and she kind of just like shuts down after her friend's death and it was really heartbreaking to see her go from this very like vivacious person to someone that is kind of like a shell of themselves and through having this mystery to solve to try and like get to the bottom of what actually happened to her best friend the person she holds nearest and dearest really kind of brought her back to life and then hunt as well is kind of dealing with the trauma of being a fallen angel and being enslaved and being forced to assassinate people for the people in charge of the city and I loved seeing them kind of like healing together and coming together in their romance. Although, you know, Sarah J Mass is kind of known for pulling a switcheroo with her romantic lead. So I'm curious to see if like they will be the end game or not. I don't know, man, because it's only book one and you never know with Sarah J Mass. So yeah, the lore was really well thought out. And like, I have to say the way that the end scene, like the big climatic scene of this book was written was really, really cool. And I loved how the technology played into it. Just so well done like so amazing and if you know you know <laughs> i don't know it's just this book has my whole heart i love the side characters too like rune and juniper and all that like sarah j mass is just known for having a wide ensemble cast and i do always appreciate all of the other characters and how they're going to play into each other and she's also the master of placing hints early on in the book that end up being important later on and i saw that all over with this book and i have some predictions for how i think it's going to go in the future but i just like don't know and it just keeps me so invested and i also love how this was not only like they were trying to catch a demon but it's like a mystery as well because they don't know who the culprit is instead of like trying to fight something like the the thing that moved the po the plot forward was that they were trying to like solve this mystery and figure out what's going on so you know that's always a, that's a little bit different than what is usually going on in sarah j mass books because usually it's like a, a quest of sorts but yeah, just like so, so smartly done and like, I don't know, I just love Sarah J.M.S. forever. I will pretty much religiously read anything that she writes. She has yet to disappoint me. We don't talk about like Akafest because you know, that was a little disappointing, but it wasn't like that bad. <laughs> but yeah, she is my queen and I love her. I love everything that she writes. No shame. This book was amazing and it was my everything. Please check out that live show if you want a full, full like fangirling time and discussion on the book because I had so much fun doing that with my friends. The next book that I read was By the Book by Amanda Sellett and this was a buddy read with my friend Keely over at Sincerely Keely Joe and I got this arc at ALA. You can check out my ALA haul if you're curious for the other books that I got at that conference. 
This is a YA contemporary romance, which I don't typically reach for. Like at all, if I read a romance, it's usually like an adult romance. Uh, yeah, so this follows Mary Porter Malcolm, who is just starting high school and she is preparing in the only way that she knows how, an extensive review of classic literature. And basically her love of literature drives her to imagine herself as a heroine of a 19th century classic novel. When some new friends seem in danger of falling for the same tricks that the scoundrels in these novels always pull, Mary swoops in to create the Scoundrel Survival Guide, using archetypes of literature's debonair bad boys to signal red flags, and so they must go through and navigate high school this way. However, Mary finds herself in danger of falling for a scoundrel herself. This was just a really cute and sweet book. I ended up giving it four stars. It was a very quick read. There were some things about it that I really enjoyed, such as I love the friendship aspect of this because it seemed like in the beginning we were gonna get the mean girl trope where these like girls were like too popular to hang out with Mary, but then it turns out that they are very sweet and accepting and accept her into the fold of their friendship and we see their friendship bloom. And I really liked that we didn't get that whole like girl versus girl mean girl thing, but that they were really supportive of each other. And I also really liked how Mary's views, like she views romance and stuff through the lens of the books that she loves to read, which are classics. And we kind of see how she's like challenged on that, like how le real life doesn't always mirror fiction. Um, and we constantly got to see her <laughs> trying to like readjust and learn. So that was really sweet. I love the family dynamics because Mary does come from a big family and we get some, you know, like family drama and stuff in there. And of course the romance was just like very cute and sweet. And of course Mary has to put aside the preconceived notions that she has in her head about Alex, the bad boy of the book, and it's very cute to see their relationship progress. The one thing that I will say about this book is if you are into classic literature, it does spoil the endings of a lot of books just in the way that it references them, but if you don't care about that, then it's really fine. Like, I read this and I guess I was spoiled for some classics, but like, honestly, I don't, don't even remember at this point because I wasn't ever going to read them anyways. And then finally, the last book that I finished in April is Missions of Love, Volume 1 by Emma Toyama. I picked up this manga at Book Off in New York City when I was there with Maddie in January. And so this is about a cell phone novelist, Yukina Himero, has decided that in order to satisfy her readers demand for love stories she must find a love interest of her own and she has this very icy reputation and so she kind of blackmails this boy into teaching her like love and affection. It's very fun, almost like a little taboo ris risque novel where they're always like trying to challenge one another and one up one another. And so I just thought it was a really enjoyable and fun manga and I ended up giving it four stars. And with that, that is everything that I read in March and April. Thank you for taking this time to catch up with what I have been reading. Already in May, I've read a decent amount of books, so maybe there will be more to my May wrap up and I, I will just do it in a month. Even if I don't read a super lot, I sometimes think it's easier to make these videos in small batches because my throat kind of gets dry talking for this much time. So yeah, uh, let me know if you've read any of these books and what your thoughts are down below or what was your favorite book that you read in March or April and have some fun, read some books and I'll catch you guys in the next one.